Welcome to Lynn Cullen Live. Talk radio <coughs> without the static. Email your questions and comments to lynncullenshow at gmail.com. And now your host, Lynn Cullen. Yep, far as I know, here I am. Welcome to the show. Oh, God. I'm building an ark in the back yard. Uh, man, I know my mother and my sister are in Green Bay without heat, and uh, they've lost their electricity, and they've got like a, you know, a more blizzardy kind of situation going on. Man, this weather, something else. Just in the few uh, minutes before the show started, I was just, uh, what do they call that? I mean, doom scrolling. I was looking at the horror show that is uh, Elon Musk's Twitter, and um, (laughs) amidst all the horror, I did uh, see three things that I found... um, Amusing. One was uh, a video of Mick Jagger in a uh, clearly like a dance rehearsal kind of a room. And uh, it just said Jagger at 80 and he's practicing his his dance moves (laughs) and he's man. I mean, still light on his feet and, you know, jumping around and thising and thatting. And it was um, it was delightful. Uh, the other thing I then saw was a guy who was swimming in his pool in Taiwan when the earthquake struck. And that video <laughs> is... He's in the pool, and the water in the pool is going, you know, boom. I mean, like a way, way up, and then way the other way. And he's being, he's he's going with the flow, but you can tell he's he's trying to figure out whether he's safer in the water or she try to get out of the water. It's it's something. And some of the video from that earthquake, wow, those you know, tall buildings just. Yike. That's something I've never um, experienced, and I'd be more than happy to live out my life uh, without ever experiencing that. Um, and then the other thing I saw was a uh, uh, closer to home was a a picture of these looked like raging uh, water, and it it's and then a, t- a television uh, floats by uh, very quickly. Floating isn't quite right, but it goes back. And that was apparently from um, Fifth Avenue in McKeesport. <laughs> I don't know. Watch out for, f- you know, floating. And also, speaking of this rain, I guess the, what? The Pirates opener is in two days, and the um, the walk with the river is so high that that walkway near PNC Park is uh, three feet underwater. So if you're going to the opener, um, you might want to, you know, bring a life preserver. I don't know. Jeez. So we live in interesting times. I was uh, saying more than once, and I'll say it again, that it's it's a bitch to have to pay attention to the news. And I know that, in fact, it is uh, it is not good for my personal uh, well-being and health. And just as an indicator here today, um, when I woke up and I just started I immediately start, you know, looking at what's been going on and what is in the news. And, you know, okay. A boy shot and killed a 12-year-old and wounded two other students at the school in Finland, at a school in Finland. I'm thinking, wow, American exports. You know, I don't think that kind of thing used to happen in 
in Finland. But, you know, what goes around comes around. I don't know. And then uh, there was, uh, ah, the, the high court in Uganda has largely upheld an anti-gay law, which includes the death penalty. Um, you know, and I, you know, you just want to go back to bed. Uh, fire at an Istanbul, night, Istanbul nightclub kills 29 people. And then the horror in Israel and those aid workers, I just can't, you know, I can't. And I, I really need, um, you know, Bree, you're going to have to explain to me why we need a thought why getting to a thousand is so big. I don't understand what happens then. Uh, Bree is the one who's pushing all of you <laughs> to subscribe to the show on YouTube. Because if you do that, something, I guess, happens when we reach a thousand. And uh, we're a hundred shy, he says. I don't even know where, you know, this is, I am out of it, happily, and unhappily in it in terms of having to pay attention to the news. But I want you to know that my, uh, my unwillingness to speak about the horrors of, uh, of Gaza and Israel is not because I'm indifferent. <laughs> Quite the opposite. I am just torn apart by it ripped my guts ripped i was thrilled to see so many israelis in the streets the other night uh calling for early election so they can get netanyahu out um man they need to keep on doing that uh boy i just I don't know. The world is too much with me. That's a line from a pretty famous poem, but what poem it is, I don't know. The world is too much with me. And I want to say getting and spending. Could that be true or am I, 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 I don't know. You know, when you, you live a long time, there's just, all kinds of uh, just shreds of information, <laughs> ripped up pieces, not quite all there of information floating around in, in your head. And uh, I don't know. Oh, and there was something else in the news. I thought, uh -uh. I started to read. I thought, nope, nope, nope. And it's about a guy who worked in... Um, the development of artificial intelligence, who then got so scared at what it would mean, what it would beget, which is something that usually, as I say, these scientist types don't ever bother to think. Now, let's see, if I do this, what could possibly happen? You know, they don't look ahead. They just get excited by the positives. And they fail to acknowledge the other side of the coin. And there was this article, and I can't, I won't read it. I can't. It's just, uh, he says he's terrified now. And he has started, it made him stop working on uh, AI. And in, instead, he started a, a nonprofit called truemedia.org. Uh, that gives away free uh, the kinds of, I guess, tools necessary to determine whether whatever it is you're seeing is, in fact, real, <laughs> oh, God, or just appears incredibly to be real. And I guess he's making that available 
to uh, anyone on the sort of front lines of information dispensa dispensation, distribution, uh, you know, so journalists, fact checkers, um, and I don't know if it's available to just uh, regular folks like us who may come upon information these days, and you really do not, cannot know if what you're seeing is real. And I would argue that, yes, that is terrifying. And he feels that the opportunity for disinformation now is so extraordinary that, yeah, you know, elections can be stolen uh, by, by virtue of it. Thank you, Milton, as usual. The world is too much with us. William Wordsworth. Interesting for a poet to be named words worth, right? Perfect name. Um, I'm not forgetting what it was, but there was once a guy who I think was a head of the firefighters in Pittsburgh who had a perfect name like, you know, I don't know, what was it? It was somebody in a position, you know, and his name was, you know, essentially, what would it have been? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I can't, I can't think. But sometimes people just by coincidence or as a result of their name, I guess, sort of end up sliding into uh, the kind of profession that their name uh, suggests. There are doctors with names like that um, as well. And if you think I can think of any examples of what I'm talking about, uh, uh, you be nuts. Oh, Barbara, so what else is new? Pittsburgh has been named, I, you know, we like this stuff. Pittsburgh is named top global travel destination what? And that's by National Geographic? Really? I guess it is. Uh, it says it's a hilly tech town with steep neighborhoods, water views, tech startups. It's an alternative to San Francisco. And it even has its own Oakland. <laughs> Says for those that haven't been, Pittsburgh's a revelation. And like San Francisco, it's a mix of forward-thinking technology sectors mixed with some of the most historic and community-minded 19th century neighborhoods found anywhere. And then, of course, the hills. Um, well, that's nice. Uh, it is. Uh, I was driving with my son the other day somewhere, and we were looking at, I mean, the, the city's amazing. It just is. We were on the Boulevard of the Allies, I guess, and I was looking across uh, the river at, you know, the south side and the hills and the homes. And, I mean, there are very few places. There's no place that looks like Pittsburgh. It's an extremely... Uh, extremely beautiful and interesting city. I am avoiding talking about all the horror. I am sorry. Um, hey, I meant to tell you this the other day, and I haven't seen or heard anything else about it, but um, I suspect this is not surprising but apparently, Senator Fetterman has seen a, an exit of all the top communications people in his uh, em employ. I don't know all, but three. Three of his top communications people 
have decamped um, recently. And um, I, my, I have no idea why. I just saw that fact, and I suspect it is a result of him um, supporting Israel. That's my guess. I wouldn't know, but that's that would be my guess. Because uh, supporting Israel is not something you're supposed to do. And it has consequences. Oh, dear. Okay, so let's... I have a lot of things that I have found interesting uh, of late. And... Um, a lot of it's sort of heavy stuff, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't, <laughs> we shouldn't, uh, you know, go for it. Um, the uh, Public Source, which is one of those uh, nonprofit journalistic uh, platforms that is local, uh, and one that I support and one that you should support and certainly uh, subscribe to uh, has a fascinating piece uh, that just came out on Pitts, University of Pittsburgh's endowment. You know, I, I've often said that I, you know, I just don't understand people who give so much money to these universities and universities so often are sitting on already just the these huge, huge endowments. Why not give your money to somebody who doesn't have an endowment but could use a helping hand? Um, and it's a it's a long piece, obviously a long time in the making. Uh, but it's, if I were at the University of Pittsburgh, um, a, in any capacity as a, a student, as a, uh, faculty member and, or a, uh, administrator, I would not be made happy by, uh, this report. Uh, Pitt has an endowment that's well over $5 billion. Um, and these endowments, I mean, there are rules about how, what has to be, you know, taken out of them and spent. Endowments are the result of gifts from individual donors, many of them obviously exceedingly wealthy, and they are meant to, I mean, a lot of them come with strings attached, but generally they are meant uh, to support uh, faculty, uh, paying the faculty, uh, academic programs, um, whatever. And Pitt, it says, took out of its $5 billion plus endowment uh, last year, the last fiscal year, about $172 million. That's what it removed. And that's a big hunk of money. But it is much less than other universities with similar endowments. On average, universities with endowments of more than five billion took out close to 4% of their endowments. Pitt did just 3%. And you could say, well, big deal, 3%, 4%. Well, this is what Public Source says. That difference 
amounts to more than $43 million in one year. And that would have been enough for Pitt to give almost $3,000 in extra financial aid to every undergraduate who received grants or scholarships. And that's about 16000 Or that money could cover the average amount of student loans borrowed by the campus's incoming freshmen, clearing about $10,000 in debt for them apiece. Or it could pay uh, for 3,000 low-income students to come. In other words, Pitt, over the last six fiscal years, according to public sources, uh, you know, public source really uh, crunching the numbers and analyzing their endowment, uh, could have spent $248 million, a quarter of a billion dollars more if it just spent the average rate of similarly wealthy universities. And if, in fact, it spent as similarly wealthy public universities, which it is, it could have spent up to another $135 million more, which, whoa. So Pitt is acting sort of like a private school, and it's sitting on its money. So Public Source went and asked a whole bunch of uh, experts on this subject, and wow, I mean, I, this is what I have always expect, suspected, that so many of these universities now, they've, they've lost sight of their mission in so many ways, it seems to me. But one of the experts that's quoted in the article says that they're sort of like in a race now, that they're empire building, piling up money to compete with one another rather than spending that money to lower costs and expand access and improve edu their educational mission. And we know the high cost of college now. And Pitt's tuition has just skyrocketed. What, I mean, for a so-called public university, Here's a professor at Georgetown who specializes in this. Uh, he, he's a, his specialty is nonprofits. And he says that in general, universities with large endowments spend too little of it each year. And the fact that Pitt has been especially tight fisted is difficult to defend. Interestingly enough, the reporter who did this obviously tried multiple times to get somebody from Pitt who is in a high uh, administrative uh, position and could explain uh, how they view their endowment and why they are so parsimonious in a day and age when uh, students and their, their faculty is unionizing. I mean, they are not sharing the wealth. Um, and he said, there, this guy says, you know, they need to look at this as a, a long-term investment in their school. The, the same way they you know, holding on to the money is, it's also money in the bank to give it to the students or the teachers so you have social returns. Um, you know, over the last uh, decade or so, 
the price that the, uh, again, these are averages, the average Pennsylvania family has to pay to send a child to Pitt has grown uh, by uh, 12% to 24,000 plus a year. While the university's average financial award to students has not kept up at all. It's grown, yeah, it's grown, but not by 12%. So they're not, uh, and in the same time, Pitt's endowment has more than doubled. Their endowment has doubled in the same time, and yet their financial aid awards have grown by 9%. I, it says here the pit declined to make officials in its office of finance available. Uh, the chief investment officer offered to speak with a reporter over the summer. <laughs> I'm sorry, I could fit you in sometime in July uh, to speak with a reporter over the summer and on background which typically means they could not be named and the information they provided could not be attributed to anyone. And the reporter said, said hooey on you. Um, so I, I don't know. It's a very interesting uh, piece. And... Uh, Pitt's endowment spending trails the combined averages for similarly wealthy public and private universities. And that is true for the last uh, six years. Uh, and obviously this brings up a lot of questions, like why? Uh, now, as you know, the state of Pennsylvania is also one of the worst states in supporting, as a matter of second to last, right? I think only New Hampshire is worse in terms of the amount of money that the state legislature provides to their public uh, universities. And the Republicans, who are mostly to uh, blame for all of that, have delayed the allocation, uh, their piddling allocation, in, in recent uh, years. And uh, uh, they, they have said that they want to see these universities freeze their tuitions before they give them uh, more money. I don't, I don't know, but here's, here's again the guy at Georgetown. You know, when legislators see that you have a big endowment that you are not using to benefit your students, well, I got news for you, that motivates the legislature to cut state support. Why should I, that you can see them thinking, give you money when you're sitting on all that money and not sharing it as well as you should? So even though universities might characterize this as being, you know, well, we're just being very conservative with our money, it, you could say it's an extremely risky uh, strategy. I don't know. It goes on and on. It's a very long, um, long piece, but I I do uh, recommend it uh, to you uh, about Pitt's endowment, and it is at www.publicsource.org. That's the place you wanna uh, be. And I would hope that's a place you would support. Um, 
Milton, I'm seeing something from you, but I'm... Uh, the first person with a perfect fireman name has been a get has been a guest on your show, right? That's true. Paul Fireman. Oh, and he lives in, that's right. That's right. Paul Fireman uh, bought the old fire station uh, at the corner of Penn Avenue and I'm going to say Lexington. Those of you who live in the East End might uh, know it. And uh, yeah, so he lives there. He refurbished it. Um, there's a gym and a rehab. I, I've done rehab there, actually. Um, and he's the one who organizes that ridiculous uh, Westinghouse Park uh, 5K walk that doesn't amount to, I mean, you don't. You, and there's chairs all around to sit in. Uh But I swear there's another guy. I don't know. It might even be a... Um, I know there was a judge, too, that had an amazing name. Just perfect. Like, of course. Uh, Milton also found a guy not from here, a firefighter whose name is McBurney. Oh, why not? So, there's all of that. Um, what? I just got something that says Goldblum's coming to town. Oh, that's nice. Pittsburgh CLO. He's coming to town to... Oh, you might not know this about Jeff. It was one of the things that blew me away when I knew him when we were both very, 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 very young. Um, he's an incredible pianist. I mean, he could play anything. I think he could even play with his nose, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, but he's coming to Pittsburgh, CLO, Jeff Goldblum and the Mildred Snitzer Orchestra. What? One night only, June 1. I don't know. Well, that'd be fun. Uh, okay. I think I'm going to I'm going to remember that. I haven't seen him in so long. So it's, yeah, Goldblum on piano. Um, the Mildred Snitzer Orchestra. <laughs> I don't know. So, uh, yeah. Goldblum was 17 years old when he went away to New York City to uh, study with the great uh, drama teacher Sanford Meisner. And it just so happened that at the same time I went to New York City to study with the great Sanford Meisner. So we were, were both in that incoming class, would have been about 1970 or 69, 69 or 70. Um, I had no desire to be an actor. <laughs> I was... I was just, uh, I was a lost soul, but I um, had uh, taken up with this actor, I think I've told you about this, um, who was, you know, m more than double my age. He was, must have been in his 50s, and I was like 19 or 20, and um but he uh, he thought I had talent, <laughs> and I mostly just wanted to get out from under him. He was a domineering uh, person, and uh, and I've told you this that he then 
was offered uh, a role by Norman Jewison um, in a movie he was about to start filming in Yugoslavia. And that's when I said, he thought, Paul, the guy said, uh, you know, well, you'll come with me. And I thought, oh, no, I won't. So that's how I got away. But he insisted, and because I was still held in his thrall, he insisted angrily that if I did not go with him to Yugoslavia, uh, he insisted that I then go to New York and study with the great Sanford Meisner. So I did. And uh, that's how my path and Jeff Goldblum's path uh, crossed. It's odd, life. It's odd. Um, you know, I was thinking about something else. Do you, uh, and this, I think it's because of something that was in that children's section from the New York Times the other day. And they talked about um, how, you know, they talked about when you're embarrassed by something, how, you know, there's physical manifestations. Uh, your face reddens, you, you blush, uh, blood actually like runs. I mean, there's like your body reacts to uh, your emotional state. Um, and another way a body reacts is inappropriate laughter. And I don't know if any of you are uh, somebody who can be afflicted with the horror of inappropriate laughter, but I am and have been. And especially as a young person, when told something horrific, I often, what happened is I would laugh, not a hearty laugh, a sort of, you know, little, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. So they say, they characterize this as nervous uh, laughter. And they say that the physical thing for this is that when you laugh, you exhale more oxygen than you inhale. And it's that exhalation of oxygen that helps to reduce your heart rate, which helps you relax. So whether you know it or not, that <laughs> nervousness, your body is trying to um, help you through something that's hard, and yet it's manifesting in an inappropriate manner. That then reminds me of um, another uh, talk about inappropriate laughter at a funeral. Now, the best funerals are filled with laughter, right? Um, they're filled with joyous laughter at memories, remembrances of, uh, and well, they're filled with laughter and tears and the whole thing. That's what it should be. And I'm sure I've told you this story, but my family was burying our father's brother, our uncle. And this is some time ago. Um, I was an adult, but a young one. And um, the funeral uh, was in Green Bay. And it was our, uh, our uncle, Louie who was beloved by us. He was uh, often uh, ate dinner with us. He was a single man, a strange, strange man, uh, not quite there in many ways. Uh, and I think for us kids, he was just like 
we thought of him as one of us. So his name was Louis Miller. And <laughs> um, when he died, the rabbi who officiated, officiated at the funeral was just new to Green Bay. So he came in and he didn't know anybody. That's got to be a hard thing to do, to, uh, you know, do a funeral of somebody who lived their lives, you know, the community knows, but you don't know nothing. And yet you're supposedly leading the community. That would be, that's a rough thing. Anyway, and he screwed up the rabbi. So we're sitting in uh, the, it was in a funeral home. We're sitting in the funeral home and the rabbi in front of the closed casket uh, says something like, we are here, you know, to say goodbye <laughs> to our dear Lewis Milson. You know, you get the name wrong, that's, that's bad. And it just so happens that Lewis Milson was another member of the Jewish community. And in fact, he had in his youth dated Lewis Miller's sister. The connections were very strong and there was some ill will between Milson and Miller. So when he, and by the way, Lewis Milson was the doctor who delivered me. So when he said Lewis Milson and got the name wrong, my brother and I, well, what are you going to do? We tried desperately not to laugh out loud. We tried desperately. We're sitting in front of the poor rabbi. We don't want to, it, it was like, and we, what is the worst thing when you're sitting next to somebody and you're both desperately trying, desperately and unsuccessfully trying to stifle your laughter? And you're sitting so close that you feel the others, you know, shoulders shaking. There is this. And I know that my brother Bill and I were literally, I mean, from behind. I remember thinking, well, we were like in the first row. So I'm thinking people behind us might think we're crying. You know, because you're oh, oh, you're crying, you're laughing, your 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 body could be moving in that way. But man, we were laid out. It was impossible. And on top of that, I had to get up and do a yabby 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 eulogy. Um, we laughed all the way to the cemetery roared because then we could we roared all the way to the cemetery ah jonathan's got a name for us last night on kdka ken flood from the cannonsburg volunteer fire department was talking about flooding and how you shouldn't drive through standing water. Did anyone make a joke? <laughs> and here we have Ken Flood on flooding. That's perfect. That's too perfect. That's wonderful. Um, okay. Sorry, Susan just texted that there's still the temperature in the house is hovering just above 60. 
So, so far they're hunkered down. But geez, my mom, you know, old people get cold so, so easily. I hope this is going to turn back on. Um, I was looking at radar a lot yesterday because this storm is just ridiculous. And the storm, it's like two sections. And over uh, Chicago and Wisconsin, you know, they're getting this same, you know, high winds. But they are getting snow instead of rain. So we should uh, be happy, right? I would hate this. Can you imagine how much snow this would be? Uh, I don't know how that works out. I think we've had almost two inches of rain. And if it were snow, good Lord. Excuse me while I take a, a swig. Okay. Um, I might be closing in on a need to take a little break, vacation, because can you tell, I like as I said, I'm struggling so. Uh, oh, my brother has just texted back to my sister, and he says, 60? Well, that's not bad. When my electricity went out, uh, our house went down to 32 for th two and a half days. <laughs> <laughs> Always got a one-up. My brother had a big retirement dinner last night from the University of Michigan School of Law, and uh, they gave him a, of course, watch. I can't believe they still do that. They, they gave him a watch, and they gave him this huge framed picture. It's two, the picture on the left that takes up half of it, is an iconic picture of Keith Richards, the uh, Rolling Stone guy, Rolling Stones guy. And the picture on the right is my brother who'd been photoshopped into that Keith Richards picture. And I mean, they look, uh, <laughs> you know, two old wizened, uh, you know, men, but it's awful, it's very cute. Very cute. So that that's, shows more uh, creativity than uh, than a watch. I just must uh, must say. Um, okay. Hang on. While hey, what's with this? I I didn't want to go here, but what's with this? Uh, disgusting human being I just read about, of course, because this has to do with Trump. Uh, disgusting human beings seem to, you know, like to be together and help each other out. Uh, and I'm talking about the guy named, here's another weird name, Hanky. Hanky. He is the one who as it turns out, I mean, stop and think about this. As it turns out, when that court saved Trump yet again from having to come up with that half a billion dollar thing in his uh, in the New York State case against him, and dropped it down to under a quarter of a billion. Um, Trump immediately said, "Well, okay, great, I can cover that." But it turns out he can't. He had to go. He, he got a bond. You got to wonder how much the guy's got. But the guy who saved him is just, for, there are so many questions. Every other group that legitimately does this kind of thing, right? Uh, provides bonds, said no, as usual, uh, to him, because he's a bad risk. And um, this guy comes in and saves him. 
And this guy is a billionaire, maybe a real billionaire, but it's how he made his money that uh, suggests that he's a vile character. He made his money, he started as a car salesman, and he ends up starting a company to give uh, car loans <laughs> to people with bad credit. Now, there is a reason, right? You don't, other legitimate kinds of operations don't want to do that. He did it because he could, obviously, you do that and you uh, charge, uh, you know, really high interest. You know, probably considered uh, usurious, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, interest. And, of course, uh, on a regular basis, the people, the poor people with the lousy credit who he gave these car loans to, uh, defaulted. And he, apparently, this guy did more, he repossessed as many as 250 cars per day. <laughs> Can you imagine that being your, that's how you're going to make your money. You're going to make your money by taking taking it from people who have none. And then you're going to turn around and you're going to give to another billionaire. Repossessing 250 cars a day. And... Uh, the U.S. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, noting all of this, uh, ended up uh, coming down on him. And for uh, he what paid? I'm good. He paid a civil penalty penalty of uh. $44 million in relief to the customers who he had employed illegal debt collection tactics. What does that mean? What is he breaking people's... Uh, this, is the, this is the guy, this is the latest savior uh, to uh, Donald Trump. And Trump now owes this guy, obviously. Owes this guy, literally. and. Who knows what else? And then I read that there's some Russian oligarch, half a, a Ameri Russian American, who's also somehow involved in in uh, giving money to Trump right now. This guy, God Almighty, uh, mm. is owes owes some of the worst people in the world, and uh, including yeah. Vladimir Putin owes him. The fact that anybody could think, hey, that guy should be president. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Oh, I've got a call. I'm sorry. I've not been doing my due diligence. Are you still there? Uh, hello? Yeah? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Sissy White Liberal here. Hey. Hey! <laughs> How are you? So, Goldblum was, was, oh, good, good. Was his first role, movie role, Annie Hall, by any chance? I've always wondered about that. Um. he had, like, a tiny, tiny bit where he asked him where his mantra was on the <laughs> I, it might have been, and also there was another, I, I want to say Nashville, um, what was it? I, I can't remember. It might have been Annie Hall. That's got to be easily Googled. I thought he had another, didn't he in a, some, 
did he sneeze and blow coke all over the place in one? No, that was a different. That was a that was an Annie Hall also, but that was a different role. He was in a party. And he was on the phone, and he's he's calling. Oh, he's calling to find out his mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, if, if if you know him personally, I just wonder if he could have anticipated Woody Allen being the absolute horrible creep that he turned out to be. I just always just kind of wondered about that, but I, um, yeah. So yeah. the reason I called real quick uh, book recommendation, the warmth of other sons by Isabel Wilkerson. Oh, um, it's about the great migration Af- of African Americans from the North or South to the North. Yes. Um, really, really good read. Um, she's, a, she's a wonderful writer in, um, you know, kind of a lot of, there's not going to be a lot of new things in there for, for people that are fairly enlightened anyway, but it's just nice to see these things boil down to how they affected three real people in their journey and what that was like. So that's, that's a really good book. Um, so if you can get her on as a, as a guest, that'd be kind of cool. I'm sure she would appreciate that. But, um, you know, my, my, our youngest daughter went to Georgetown. And you were talking about um, the endowments there. Yeah. And at schools, and I, and you just have to wonder: Are these endowments any more than medallion things that for bragging rights? Well, Why do they have all this money if they're not using it for something? You tell <laughs> so, me. So yeah, yeah. No, I it's it's crazy. And in fact, when I lived in suburban Philly, I wanted to organize a civil rights reunion type. Thing at Lincoln University, which is a you know mm-hmm. pretty well respected HBCU from right. years gone by, and they they were more even they were more worried about fundraising. And I'm like, look, why not give people that donate a reason to donate, like a, like a civil rights symposium, like. Why wouldn't you think that would be a natural thing for you people to be involved with? And um, it was really just disheartening. Um, uh, higher education, I think, in a lot of ways, seems to have lost its mission yes. in certain circumstances. It, yeah. Anything else in this country, it comes down to money first and foremost without really understanding what the money's for, why you have money, what, what good money does if, if you have it and the way you spend it. Um, it all of those things are just... They just feel like they're very lost. <laughs> no, I, 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 so. I agree. Hey, speaking of books, um, uh, there's also yeah. a book called The Stolen Wealth of Slavery. And um, it's about how so many rich families in this country, obviously their wealth derived from the uh, unpaid labor <laughs> of, of slaves. Yeah. And um, what, in this book, one of the families that is uh, cataloged is the Hillmans here. Huh. And yeah. the Hillmans, as you know, are understandably uh, uh, recognized as extremely uh, philanthropic. I mean, they have used their wealth and and done a lot of wonderful stuff with it in uh, education, healthcare, affordable housing, the arts, all that kind of stuff. But it turns out, so they go into how the family, where did that money originally come from? And, you know, you're hard pressed to find any American with tons of money where you can't then do that kind of a trace unless they are relatively uh, recent uh, immigrants like my, my like my family we do not have any we did not own slaves I'm sure of it because right. we just got here right. you know at the turn of the century and if anything we were the slaves I mean no we did not ha- have slaves But if you have been here for a while, the odds are some of your wealth, if you've got it, really belongs to black folks. 
Yeah, and the, the, the book, The Warmth of Other Suns, kind of the one thing that was kind of news to me was the basically slave, it would not be a stretch to call the wages that, that African Americans owned in the South, picking cotton, picking fruit in Florida, which is a horrible state to be from if you're an African American back then, if, if not now, for that matter, but um, just and kept them in a state of permanent indentured servitude, right. you know, through the sharecropper system. And it, it, it so, yeah, I mean, um, it, it does raise a lot of issues, um, certainly. Uh, yeah, that, that just kind of just make you shake your head. I'm, in my mind, too, by the way, in the movie Green Book, when yes. he plays piano and pitch, he's playing that piano in Elsie Hillman's house. I don't know if that's true or not. But that's that's what was going on in that in in my mind when when that pianist played in Pittsburgh. Huh. So I don't know if that's the case or not. Huh. You do maybe you have insight. I don't know. <laughs> I do know that Hillman's house is now uh, CMU bought it. <laughs> With mm-hmm. their, God knows what their endowment is. CMU bought it, and it is now where uh, their. Uh, there, there was that a chancellor or the president of CMU uh, lived in the Hillman House. Wow! Yeah, it was, no, yeah, not, no, yeah. It was completely refurbished. I guess the Hillmans, you know, I don't know. It was completely refurbished. So well, I I will tell. You- in about 58 days, I'll be popping a champagne cork in the car as I head north, just like Ben Affleck and Argo when I leave this state. So headed 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 back to Pittsburgh here. Yes. Again, so. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, well, I'll pop a cork too. We'll get together and pop some corks. Yes. That would be nice. Hey, <laughs> thanks so that much. Would be good. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. the call. Take care, Lynn. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right, guys, I guess we, um, uh, I don't know. Uh, okay. I think I done did that. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I feel like, uh, oh, here. Now I'm on another screen that's giving me more. Uh, yes, he was in Annie Hall. And Milton says Goldblum made his film debut as a what? A home invading thug in the 1974 Charles Bronson film Death Wish? Really? Was that the first? <laughs> well, um, I'll tell you how he got out of the neighborhood playhouse. I mean, you talk about, again, serendipity how does somebody get he had a ton of talent i mean he just clearly did um he was the youngest kid in the class and the way that school worked is you uh you know if you made it into the first year uh you you were fine there's maybe about 60 students but you had to be invited <laughs> into a second year. And uh, usually no more than a third of the students made that cut. Um, so it was a very competitive um, environment. And uh, astonishingly, I made the cut. I, I mean, again, I didn't even want to be an actress. I made the cut. Goldblum, I must have made the cut. But that summer, in between, uh, you know, before the next school year began, the head of the school, a guy named Paul Morrison, received a phone call. And it was from, oh boy, a guy named Joseph Papp. Am I getting that name right? He did Shakespeare in the Park. He was a producer in New York. And he called Morrison and said, hey, uh, we got this, you know, I don't know, they were doing some Shakespeare in the Park thing. 
and we need you got some uh, a tall you got some tall uh, guys over there. Uh, they needed like essentially a guy holding a spear or something. I mean, they needed a tall. The rest is history. Yeah, Morris. Yeah. Got this kid, Jeff Goldblum. He's tall. And so that was Jeff's first one to film. <laughs> it put him in with people who were movers, shakers, and in the biz. And all I can say is, even though I went to the second year, Jeff was nowhere to be found. He was up and running. Stuff happens in our lives. Thank you all so much. Stay dry. Don't go into still waters, as the flood expert, Mr. Flood, uh, told us, okay? And uh, other than that, I think uh, I'm out of here. Lynn Cullen Live, Monday through Thursday from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. and archived at pghcitypaper.com. The opinions expressed on Lynn Cullen Live are those of the hosts and do not necessarily reflect the viewpoints of Pittsburgh City Paper or its advertisers.